Hello everybody and welcome to the MedAce Biostatistics course for medical students. This is chapter 4 of section 1. In this chapter we are going to talk about samples, populations, and randomization. These are extremely important concepts in health research which you need to be familiar with in order to understand medical literature. In this chapter we are going to define samples and populations, we are going to introduce and define probability and non-probability samples. We're going to talk about the most common types of probability sampling. We're also going to briefly talk about non-probability sampling techniques. Then we're going to finish off by going over the concepts of representativeness and randomization and how these techniques can help decrease the risk of selection bias. So let's get started. What is a population in terms of health research? A population is the total amount of subjects or people in a defined setting or who meet a certain criteria. For example, all the people in New York City or all the people with lung cancer are examples of populations. The goal of most health research projects is to make conclusions about populations. For example, determining the rates of new lung cancer cases in New York. However, in most cases, it is very hard or even impossible to study the entire population. Imagine trying to design a study and enroll every person with lung cancer in the country. That would be very hard, expensive, and time-consuming. In order to circumvent the difficulty of studying the entire population, a sample is used. A sample is a small group of subjects or individuals picked from the population who are representative of the population of interest. It is much easier to study a sample, and the conclusions made from studying the sample can be used to make valid inferences about the entire population. However, the consequence of using a sample is that bias or error can occur when the sample is not representative of the target population. Specifically, do you know which kind of bias or error occurs when the sample population is not representative of the target population? If you thought selection bias, you are correct. Selection bias happens all the time in health research, and for that reason many techniques have been developed to decrease the risk of selection bias. In this chapter we will talk about two techniques for decreasing the risk of selection bias, probability sampling and randomization. Let's start with sampling. Generally, there are two main types of samples, probability samples and non-probability samples. The difference between a probability sample and a non-probability sample is that in a probability sample, all members of the population have a chance of being included into the study sample. In a non-probability sample, some members of the population have a 0% chance of being included in the study. Probability samples have a higher likelihood of being representative of the target population. This decreases the risk of selection bias. For this reason, probability samples are considered superior to non-probability samples. Non-probability samples, on the other hand, introduce bias into studies and therefore studies which use non-probability samples have a very high risk of bias. This is bad because as we said in the previous chapter, studies with a high risk of bias have low validity and therefore high risk of making incorrect study conclusions. So in order to make valid generalizations about populations, you need to use probability samples. Now let's talk about the different techniques for obtaining probability samples. Generally, there are four techniques for obtaining probability samples. The choice between which to use depends on things such as the characteristics of the population, the resources available, and the types of variables being analyzed in the study. Let's go over them one by one. The simplest probability sample is the simple random sample. In a simple random sample, every member of a population has an equal chance of being included in the study. This type of sampling can be thought as a lottery machine in which every individual is represented by a lottery ball, and random balls are obtained until the target sample size is met. 
The next type of sampling technique is called systematic sampling. In systematic sampling, individuals from the population are assigned an order and participants are selected based on a fixed periodic interval. For example, every eighth individual is picked. The next type of probability sample is the stratified sample. Before we go into details, let's picture this. Imagine you wanted to take a probability sample of a population which has more males than females, such as this one in which there are more males, depicted in blue, and females, depicted in pink. If you performed a simple random sample, or systematic sample, you would most likely end up with a sample which has more males than females. This could be a problem, especially if you wanted to include an equal number of males and females in your study. The way to deal with this problem is to perform a stratified sample. In a stratified sample, the population is stratified or grouped based on the characteristic of interest, which in this case is gender. You would then perform a simple random sample of each group. This procedure would ensure that you have an equal representation of every type of individual in your study while still being a probability sample. You could do this for more than two characteristics. All you would need to do is create a strata or group for every characteristic of interest. For example, you could create a strata for every race and ethnicity that you wanted to include in your study. The next type of probability sample that we're going to discuss is the cluster sample. In cluster sampling, the entire population is broken down into many clusters. Like this, we can imagine that every different group of colors represents a different cluster. A random sample of clusters would then be selected. Either every member of a cluster is included in the study or a simple random sample is obtained from the selected clusters. So in other words, you would break up the population into many small clusters and then you would select a random sample of clusters to include in your sample. This type of sampling is performed when the population is spread out geographically. For example, we could use this type of sampling if we wanted to obtain a sample of the entire city of New York. We could make a list of all the zip codes of New York City and then pick a random sample of zip codes. We could then enroll all the subjects from those randomly selected zip codes into the study. Now let's look at an example. Researchers are interested in studying the characteristics of people who visit the emergency room in a large city. They decide to use a sampling technique in which every tenth patient that is registered into the patient log is selected to be included in the study. Is the sample obtained a probability sample or non-probability sample? Well, based on the information given to us, the researchers appear to be using a systematic sampling technique. As we said before, systematic sampling is a type of probability sample. Next question, is this sampling technique associated with a high risk of bias? Well, given that the researchers are using a probability sample, every patient that comes into the ER has a chance of being included in the study. Therefore, the sample generated is likely to be highly representative of the target population. And as we said before, high representativeness prevents selection bias. So this sampling technique is associated with a low risk of bias. Next example. Researchers are interested in studying the characteristics of people who visit the emergency room in a large city. They decide to set up a stand outside of the emergency room with signs that say, come participate in our study. They then wait for people to volunteer to enroll in the study. Is the sample obtained a probability sample or non-probability sample? Based on the information given, it seems that the researchers are depending on patients who are willing to volunteer to enter the study. While this is likely an easier technique than the one employed by the first group of researchers, it is not a probability sample. This is because not every patient has a probability of being enrolled in the study. Only those who are willing to enroll have a probability of entering the study. Therefore, this is a non-probability sample. Next question, is this sampling technique associated with a high risk of bias? Well, given that not every person has a chance of being included in the study, suggests that it is likely that the sample obtained is not representative of the target population. Therefore, there is high risk of selection bias.
So why is non-probability sampling bad for making generalizations about populations? The reason for this is because when you obtain a non-probability sample, you are obtaining a sample which may not be representative of your target population. Individuals with certain important characteristics may be overrepresented or underrepresented in the sample. For example, let's assume you want to make generalizations about the target population which includes individuals of many colors. However, your sample only includes individuals with different shades of red. Any conclusions you make from this sample will only apply to the population of red individuals, and not the entire target population which includes individuals of various other colors such as yellow, blue, green, or gray. This type of error is called the selection bias. So the problem is that when you obtain a non-probability sample, you risk obtaining a sample like the one in this example, in which your individuals are red and not representative of all the other colors, such as yellow, blue, green, gray, etc. So now let's look at some examples of non-probability sampling techniques. Quota sampling is a type of sampling method in which investigators are told to interview a certain number of individuals or quota. The individuals must have certain characteristics such as age, gender, race, nationality, etc. However, once these characteristics are met, the investigators are free to select the individuals as they please. Another type of non-probability sampling technique is called convenient sampling. In convenient sampling, investigators only select individuals which are easy or convenient to include in the study. This is similar to what the researchers in example 2 did. So far we have discussed the reasons why in order to obtain a sample with high representativeness we need to use a probability sampling technique. However, that is not the end of the story. You also need to obtain a large enough sample to accommodate for all the variability in the population. Let's go back to our previous example with the colorful individuals. Let's say you wanted to obtain a random sample which is representative of the population. That is, you want a sample which is representative of all the different colors in the population. Let's assume you pick a simple random sample of four for your sample, that is, four individuals. You can imagine that if you do this, you will end up with a sample that is not representative of the target population despite using a good sampling technique. This is because a sample of four is too little to take into account all the different types of individuals in the population. In the graphic I have shown, there are at least 15 different colors of many shades. The concept is the same when it comes to research. If the sample size is too small, it will likely not be representative of the target population. So in summary, if you want the highest possibility of having a sample which is representative of the target population, you need to both use a probability sampling technique and include a large enough sample size. Okay, so so far we have talked about probability sampling and the concept of representativeness and how they help reduce the risk of selection bias. There is another type of random sampling technique which is used in randomized controlled trials and is also used to minimize the risk of selection bias in these types of studies. We have not yet talked about randomized controlled trials, but I want to introduce you to this concept now because it is related to random sampling. We will revisit this in our chapter on randomized controlled trials in section 3. In randomized controlled trials, random sampling is used to assign study participants to exposure and outcome groups. This is known as randomization. This is done in order to ensure that the exposure and comparison groups are identical in every respect except for the exposure of interest. Otherwise, the risk of selection bias and confounding bias increases. In order to ensure that the randomization was successful, that is, that it successfully created two groups of study subjects which are identical in terms of characteristics, a baseline characteristics table is used. Typically, many characteristics are measured such as age, gender, comorbidities, and etc. If the characteristics between the groups are very similar in the baseline characteristics table, then the randomization is assumed to be successful. Let's look at an example in order to conceptualize this. We have not talked about randomized controlled trials yet, but this is basically how a randomized controlled trial looks like. In a randomized controlled trial, a sample is obtained from the population which typically does not have the outcome of interest. The sample is then split into two groups or arms. One group receives the exposure while the other group receives a placebo or no exposure. 
So let's imagine a hypothetical study in which the normal variation of the study subjects are represented by various colors. It is important that both groups or arms of the study are representative of the original sample, because the original sample is assumed to be representative of the target population. If the groups are not identical in terms of characteristics, which in this case is represented by colors, you may get a situation in which the groups are no longer representative of the sample population, and if the group is not representative of the sample population, then it is not representative of the target population either. This is a type of selection bias called the ascertainment bias, and we will talk about it more in our chapter on bias. So when you look at the baseline characteristics table, you are checking to see if both arms of the study are similar in terms of various characteristics. If both arms are similar, then it is assumed that that randomization was successful and both arms of the study are representative of the original sample population. If both arms are representative of the original sample population, then it can be assumed that they are also representative of the target population. We are going to talk about bias a lot more in future chapters. For now, just realize that randomization is an extremely important technique which is used in research to decrease the risk of selection bias and confounding bias. Okay, so now let's look at another example. Researchers conduct a randomized control trial to study the effect of a new beta blocker on mortality in people with New York Heart Association Class 4 systolic heart failure. The baseline characteristics of each group is shown in the table below. What conclusions can be made from the baseline characteristics? Okay, so let's analyze the data on the table. We can see that the characteristics of the people in the beta blocker or exposure group are very similar to those in the control group. For example, the mean age was almost the same. The number of males and females was almost the same. Mean GFR was very similar and the number of comorbidities was also very similar. Therefore, the exposure group and the control group are very similar and can be assumed to be representative of the original study sample before randomization. In other words, both groups are representative of the target population. Therefore, there is low risk of selection bias and confounding bias. In summary, the goal of randomization is to produce two random samples which are both representative of the target population. Okay, so we have covered a lot today, but these are the points that you should take home. A study with a sample that is not representative of the target population will suffer from selection bias. In order to create samples with high representativeness and low risk of bias, probability samples of large size should always be obtained. Probability sampling techniques include simple random sampling, systematic sampling, stratified sampling, and cluster sampling. Studies which use non-probability samples have a high risk of selection bias. Probability sampling and randomization both lower the risk of selection bias and confounding bias. Thank you for watching and see you on the next chapter.